this is one of them special episodes because from the days of Clubhouse, connecting with Canadians, <laughs> with Clubhouse and the Dragon's Den, and my man had to pull up to the city. Eric, what's up, man? I'm stoked to be here, man. A long drive. I think the drive from Hamilton to London is the longest drive in Canada. <laughs> and is. I've driven to Vancouver and back and Halifax and back. Something about that highway is just as long and flat and boring, but I did it with reason. I did it to come see you, be My on bro. the podcast. You've got the studio. Yeah, man. You're all set up, man. This yeah, is man. crazy shit. Listen, love, peace, and prosperity and appreciation for you. And That's right. Fuck, you're on a run right now. Thanks, man. And I yes. just want to say I'm excited to be here. I'm excited that you're not wearing shorts. Uh, every one of your podcasts, I see you're wearing shorts, and it's just a direct shot right into your testicles. And every clip I see go out, I go, this guy better not be wearing shorts today. But I was, here's the thing, I usually iron a shirt for these type of things, but I was like, I know this guy's going to be in a full track suit, so I'm just going to wear a t-shirt here today. <laughs> this man just roasted me, man. Jeez. That's all I got for you. I'm glad you got yeah, pants man. on. Um, let's round of applause. Best-selling author. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I, I can't uh, I can't believe it. The, the, the book launched on February 1st, 2024. And on February February second, twenty twenty four, it was number one bestseller in comedy, number one bestseller in wrestling, number one bestseller in sports humor, number one hot new release. Got to num number seventy one on all books on Amazon, um, and just like just crazy, man. I can't, I cannot believe the success of this thing. You're and, killing it, and though. yeah, I mean. And then, you know, a thousand books get released a day on Amazon. So all my numbers have since slipped. But now I'm selling physical copies at shows and touring all over Canada. And You're recording doing, the audiobook too? Record, I did record recording an audiobook right now. I'm almost done. That's been a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, man. Because you got to know your pace and you yeah. got to catch everything. You're reading 270 pages out loud. Yeah. So, you know, that that is the difference of not, rather just reading and not only reading it, but reading it so the listener can understand exactly what's happening. Yeah. Because talking and reading are two completely different muscles. Oh, so sure. putting those two together and creating the audio book has been a whole experience in itself. I feel you. And, yeah. What was uh, one of the biggest overcoming adversaries of writing that book? Um, I'll tell you, it was the actual writing of it. You know, my I, I was approached by a, a legendary sports writer. His name is Greg Oliver, and he's written 20 books on sports, wrestling, baseball, football, all kinds of stuff. And, um, and he approached me, actually, and was like, hey, um, you know, I think there's a book in here. He knew my dad and he was aware of my grandfather and he's followed my career since I started. And he said, I think now is the time to write a book and do a book. And, you know, for the last 18 months, he went out and did a bunch of research and, and uh, interviewed all these old wrestlers and sourced all these old wrestling articles and clippings and magazines and really pieced together a beautiful thing. So the start of every chapter is Greg's section and Greg writes the who, what, where, when, why, how it happened, when it happened, who was there, who won, who lost, who promoted it, who did it. Um, and then the second half of her chapter is my experience with that. And every section is called Eric's Bull. So every, every chapter has two parts, all the information and uh, all of the, uh, you know, all of my experiences. And putting those together and actually sitting down and writing, because I can talk all day. We, we, we both know that you can just sit and talk, but then formulating it into, you know, cohesive thoughts and stories and and making it funny, but also making it real and making it emotional, making it raw. Like I didn't shy away from any topics on this on this book. I talked about my dad's successes, but I also talked about my dad's failures and my grandfather's failures. And I talked about their struggles with mental health and addiction and alcoholism and all kinds of stuff and all this, the dark side of professional wrestling. And to really dive deep into all of those places and do all of those that, you know, go to those places was hard. It was very hard for me, but it was beautifully therapeutic and you know uh it was just it was like i i let all this stuff off my chest and now is the time to you know just treat it as the story that it is and give it to the people which yeah, people are buying it all over the world i guess yeah. i saw on my amazon that one got shipped to germany and the one got shipped shipped to italy shit um you know and all over canada obviously into the united states i got friends in florida and new york and everybody's buying it and sharing it and telling friends and that's really why you do something like this i feel you and i feel like it's gonna lead you to the next step 
I did a little clipping on my phone before we hit the record button. Yeah. And I'm like, it's coming. I know it's coming. Yeah. The, I think so too. The, it's coming. Netflix is coming. Bro. Yeah. Or if it's Amazon, whoever. Whatever it is. They're coming. What, whatever it is. Yeah. And, and I'm happy to to wait, to wait, so to speak. You know, mm. they say in Canadian comedy and, and comedy in general, it takes 15 years to make an overnight success. Mm. And I'm in my 14th year. So. Damn. It's here, and I'm, I'm ready feeling for it, man. I'm I got that goosebumps it. right there, man. Yeah, like la last night, I did a show at the Hamilton Place Theater, which is huge. It's Hamilton's biggest venue. It's Hamilton's biggest theater. The biggest comics in the world have performed there: Jerry Seinfeld, Jim Jefferies, Bill Burr. And then I stood on that stage last night, and I fucking killed. What? What did? How did you do that? How did that feel for you, though? Just Amazing, knowing those dude. Legends I cried after. There. I went into the green room and I broke into tears. Shit. I was sitting on the chair and just like sobbing and it was good tears it was like if if anything last night's show proved that i deserve to be here with these huge legends and you know also on the show was you know sean majunder who's canadian comedy legend elvira elvira kurt is a canadian comedy legend it was it was the canadian comedy hall of fame festival and i got asked to do 15 minutes on it and it was like i blacked out i left my body i knew my material I knew what I was doing, and I went up there. In situations like that, I get bigger. I'm already a big, big guy, big personality. But when there's couldn't tell when you came through well, the doors. <laughs> <laughs> I kicked the door down. Everyone's like, "Someone's here." I know, right? Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, it, there was 800 people out there, and they deserve the absolute best and biggest version of me, and they got it. I didn't leave anything on the table last night. I was yelling and sweating. My hair was all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Every picture of me doing that show last night is hideous because there's no vanity in comedy. No? Like it's all facial expressions, and I'm sweating, I'm pointing, and I'm kicking. You didn't do the dance? Nah, nah, nah. I say that for different events. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't getting paid enough to start dancing, but that dance is legendary, man. <laughs> That's the money maker too. That's it, man. It, for a big guy like me, I'm six one two forty five, and the fact that I can move and tap dance and yeah. swing dance and stuff. Yeah. Because that's how I started in show business when I was a kid. I wanted to get into show business. I wanted to be on TV. I wanted to be out there on stage and everything. And the only thing I could do as a six-year-old kid was competitive dance. So I did dance every day for seven years across Ontario, competing, performing, these huge theaters and these big dance competitions and these big conference centers. And it just made me so comfortable to be on stage. Love and that. now I, it's, it's second nature to Love me. Love that. So what keeps you up at night? Because you're so going right now. You're in go mode. <laughs> what keeps you up, my man? I'm actually sleeping pretty well, man. I'm okay. actually sleeping pretty well. Um, you know, I'm married to the love of my life. We just bought a house. We're working on having kids. My career's never been better. The book's number one bestseller. Everywhere I go, my shows are selling out. And it's it's organic. I'm not, I'm not a viral sensation. I'm not a big YouTube or TikTok or Instagram guy. I'm just a guy who puts show posters up and just... 100 percent based on word of mouth the shows are selling out i love that and it's just people going you got to go see this guy you got to go see this guy you got to go see this guy you and yeah you speak to the love of your life you you spoke about her on the second episode yeah yeah we had just started dating last yeah, time you and i talked right? now we're married and we now have a house married. we're trying to have kids speak to the importance of how she serves that that purpose in your life it's um it's it's really important to me because I I was feel like I was I was lost without her. You know, I was single and I was a little bit of a scumbag and I was going out. My only goal was to go out, do shows, and get laid. That was my only that was my whole life. And now when I met this this girl that completely took me out of that lifestyle, I look back at that old lifestyle that I was living in and I'm like, ugh. Like it's 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 it was gross. It was it was all very, you know, fun while I was doing it, but when but I didn't have that love in my life. I didn't have that person. I didn't have, you know, it's so cheesy. Like I I found my person, but I really I truthfully found my person. Yeah. And she's you can see that, though. Yeah, and she's supportive of me. She's beautiful. She's she's successful in her own right. She's a very successful real estate agent. She has business sense, you know, she's talking to me about, you know, ways to elevate my career beyond comedy. Like as a businessman, and that is is the most important. I was already in a very astute, you know, very accomplished businessman. I'm my own promoter. I'm my own manager. I'm my own marketing team. I'm my own Instagram guy. I'm my own social media guy. I'm my own graphic designer. I'm my own tour router. I make all my own posters. Oh, I, I feel that. Trust shows. me. You don't think I, I do the exact same <laughs> thing, brother. And then running it down, all the accolades. I love and it. All that stuff I did myself. And now to have a support where she's looking at it and going, that's interesting. I saw you did that like that. Have you considered doing it this way? Mm. And I'm going, 
no, but now yes. Value. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. So having that in my, you know, in my life has been so valuable. And she wants me to succeed as much as I want to succeed, which again, for the relationship works. I mean, yeah, financially great. We're pay our mortgage with real estate and with comedy. Um, but she truthfully wants to see me succeed. And that is the most important thing. And the, besides the fact that we love each other, we're, we're true partners in every sense of the word. We're, we're romantic partners. We're business partners. We're life partners. She's my best friend. And I used to make fun of people. <laughs> when people would be like, oh, my wife is my best friend. I'm like, no, she's not. Like your best friend from elementary school is your best friend, okay? You can't make fun of your wife like how you make fun of your friends. <laughs> um, but truthfully, I, I she is my best friend. She's my my partner in life, and I can't. It's I've only known her for three years, and and we're married and have a home, and it's like you know all that uh, all that stuff has come together in terms of like rather quickly, yeah. But it feels like I've known her my entire life. It feels like she's been supporting me my entire life. That's what's up. And you, what I feel like I talked about on the last episode that I just did there was that grounding energy. Yeah. And you can see that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can be very um, high D personality, right? I can be very protective and aggressive, especially when I feel like someone's trying to fuck me. Uh, I get very, I have very... um, uh, like people will, I, I realized this recently, you know, when you, when someone tries to take advantage of you and you catch them, they will try to label you difficult to work with. Love that. You just said that. And, and, Woo! and I am not difficult to work with. I'm extremely easy to work with, but I'm very hard to rob. It's very hard to take advantage of me and people get upset they go, that guy's hard to work with. And then it'll come out that, no, it was not me. It was someone trying to change the deal last minute or someone trying to say that I said something. What I started doing now, and it's crazy, is if I'm in a meeting and we're talking about business points, I pick, take my phone, I hit record, and I put it on the table. Mm. And I go, hey, just because we're talking about business points here, I'd like to have record of this. Woo! You'd be amazed. Value. You'd, ma- you'd be amazed how many people then stop talking out of their ass. I did a show recently and, um, you know, I did a show recently and the show was great. I sold almost 500 tickets and it was a really big event. Um, but during the initial meetings for the event, they made me every promise under the sun. And they're going to, we're going to get you this. We're going to get you that. We're going to be doing this. We're going to get you on the radio. We're going to get you the newspapers. We're going to personally sell 400 tickets. We're going to do this. And they did none of it. None of it. It was entirely on me to sell this show and promote this show and get myself on the radio, which is fine. It's something that I'm used to doing. But the fact that they said all these things and then didn't do it, I then called them out and was like, hey, in that initial meeting, this is before I was recording this stuff. uh, In the initial meeting, I was like, you said all these things and you did none of them. And then they banned me from the venue after the show because I did the show, they paid me, and they said, we never want to work with you again. And I went, oh, you never want to work with me again because you realize that I'll call you out on your shit. Mm. And sometimes I get very angry. Sometimes I get overwhelmed. And sometimes I get very, I can't believe they're doing this to me. And Jana will walk in the room and go like, hey, what's going on? And I'll explain it to her. She goes, okay. Or sometimes my wife will catch me like responding to an email very aggressively because it's someone that's trying to lie to me. And I'm trying to get to the bottom of the fact that they're trying to lie to me. And uh, she'll be like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, just, uh, <laughs> no, no, nothing. I'm just responding to an email. She goes, let me read it. Let, let me read what you're saying. And then I'll show her. And she goes, I don't know if you should be saying that. I don't know if you should be doing that. I think you should sleep on this. I think you should wait 24 hours. I think there's another side of the story that you haven't heard yet. And I think when it comes out, you're going to realize that it came out. And you're going to realize that you might be the dickhead in this situation. And so, it's and it's happened before, where it was a total misunderstanding, and the guy just didn't communicate with the other guy. That's why it looked like they were trying to rob me. Not and, only you're the comedian, you're the author, and you're giving us business value fucking lessons. Sure, here. dude. It's show, called show business yeah. for a reason. And, I and think it, I've said it that too before. To, yeah, and it speaks to a lot because, like, like me and my camera guy probably go through the exact same thing with business and podcasting. People taking advantage of you. Yeah. 
I've realized now in the last year and a half, I'm too accessible. Sure. Because sure. a lot of people see what you're doing and how you're growing and they want to reach out to you. Oh, let me pick your brain here. But yeah. What are you the, giving the, back as value? Yeah. The worst, the worst thing someone can ask me is, can I pick your brain? Oh, that's and I go, okay, so for the price of a cup of coffee, you want everything I've worked for for the last 14 years. You want all of my connections. You want all of my opportunities. You want all the names and emails of all the things that I had to go and get myself and show up for and drive across Canada for. You want that for the price of a cup of coffee? I can't do that for you. Now people know I'm so busy that it's easy for me to be like, I'm sorry, man. If you have any questions, I can answer them online, but I, I just don't have time to, to meet for a coffee so you can pick my brain and, and steal from me. That's all it is. That's all it is. That's all it is. You know, I, I, I don't want to call anybody really out per se on this pod, but do you it. get a lot. Of <laughs> no, I, I, was, I was helping somebody. You're mentoring them. You're putting them into position. And then you realize it's like you're giving them all this value, but they're not giving you anything back. Yeah, yeah. All you get is emojis and like a thumbs up or a yeah. heart. And then you realize that you got to dial that back a little bit because it's who you are and they see that they can take that from you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So now it's consultation. Yeah. You, we, we talk is 15 minutes. Yeah. Consultation and then anything else is coming off the books. Sure. Sure. That's yeah, yeah. it. Like you better, you better have your QuickBooks ready, like figure yeah. it out. I'll be you know what I mean? Invoice. Yeah, and that's yeah. what it all comes down to because with content creation, with podcasting, everybody wants this. They want all this information, but it's like, there's a whole other platform. There's search engines out there. Yeah. But they don't want to do it because they're lazy. Of course. And I, I know sometimes when I, when I pitch someone for a meeting, if there's something that I need, mm -hmm. but it's not even necessarily I need. The thing that I need is the relationship. I don't want you to do anything for me. And I always have to, what I like to do, and it settles people, if I'm setting up a meeting, I go, hey, I just, I just want to let you know, I don't want anything from you other than this friendship. I'm not, I don't have any ulterior motives to us meeting. I just want to sit down with you. And yeah, maybe it's pick your brain, but it's, I just want to create a relationship with you that will be mutually beneficial for both of us because you have things that I don't know and I have things that you don't know. And we can come together and break bread and discover those things together. But I'll never walk into a meeting with an open hand and go, hey, give me. You know, I always try to include everybody i always try to book local comedians and i always try to book um you know make sure that if i'm going to a town and i'm doing the show on my own if i find out that there's a local promotion or production company that does comedy um i'll try to bring them in to make the, uh, them included and give them a piece because i'm trying to grow their business because in comedy and show business the more people doing it successfully the better for the business there's too much crabs in the bucket there's too much in show business, everyone wants you to do well, but nobody wants you to do better than them. Mm. So people will be supportive, but if you start doing better than them, then you're enemy number one. Exactly. Because it's all competition. But if, I, if you change your outlook and say, no, no, there's room for all of us at the table, we can all eat, then that should and could effectively change the entire business. Unfortunately, only guys like you and I believe that. We can't turn 100,000 people into believers in what we believe. They just have to go and do it and do it incorrectly and run out of room themselves, run out of road. Patrick, Patrick Bet David. I don't know if you're familiar with who he is. Patrick okay. Bet David. I've heard the he, name. Um, he wrote a book also too called uh, Choose Your Enemies Wisely. Sure. And he speaks a lot about that as using things as fuel and realizing that there's other people that don't want to, they're like the gatekeepers mm -hmm. in certain sp positions and stuff like that. But you got to like really, really dive, deep dive, how can you speak? You got to really deep dive yep. into dive deep. the things that matter as far as who's your enemy, who's kind of you want to get to, but not stomping on people to get there. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to be, we're, we're, we're all, you know, inspired by somebody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And for me, it's like in this podcasting space, like one of the biggest guys in podcasting was Joe Budden. Still to this day, Joe yeah. Budden used to rap, used to do all this. Of course, he used but to. now, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now he's a successful podcaster. Sure. And you look at those guys where it's like, at some point in time, I would love to sit down with him. Not sure. for an hour, but like 10 minutes. I'll take a yeah. 10 minute conversation with him. Yeah. Because I know sure. that 10 minute conversation is going to provide extreme value. Yeah. You know I, mean, I mean, I think the value to relationships is huge. And the handshakes and the face to face is the biggest thing in the world. You know, I've grown my Instagram to, I don't know, 
12,000 followers, which in the influencer world is nothing, it's peanuts. Mm -hmm. But I can probably tell you 9,000 of those people who follow me, I could probably tell you where I met them, when I met them, where I shook their hand, their family story, if they're married, if they're single, if they have kids, what city they live in, because I've met them in person at a show. And they've come to my show and they've come to my merch table. They've introduced themselves and they followed me and I followed them back. That is worth more money, worth more relationship wise than if I had a million followers. And I love that. And it speaks to that. And you don't need to have the big monster audience. Like let's call out somebody, for instance, Jake Paul. Jake Paul doesn't know half his audience. He no, probably knows like no. a 2% of yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. 2% of it. He's lucky. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. But he knows that. And he probably doesn't even run his Instagram and stuff like that. But we yeah. see all the DMs. I've gone viral a couple times on Instagram. Yeah. And it brings a lot of people to my page. But it's all people I don't know. And it makes me feel weird. Yeah. It makes me feel like, uh, I don't know these people. Yeah. And I would like to know them. But <laughs> you would like to. But yeah. the thing is this is when you go to that city, they're going to be like, yo, I saw that post. Ba, 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 yeah, this, yeah. that. You know what I mean? That actually like, happened uh, in London. Mm-hmm. I went viral during the pandemic for a um, like a meme, a Dumb and Dumber meme. Mm -hmm. So stupid. It was like about Omnicron. <laughs> and it was, <laughs> but that video got 13 million views. It got a million shares. Jeez. And I, um, I didn't watermark it. I didn't, I didn't um, like let people know it was my thing. I just put it up and it went viral. Um, and I was here in London seeing Mumford and Sons at the Rock the Park Festival. That wasn't too long ago. No, that was in, that was in uh, London yeah, yeah. in the summer. And I was standing there, and some lady came running over to me. And her husband uh, is the owner-manager of Audi London. Okay. And they had a big booth at the, at the festival. And she came running over to me. She's like, oh, my God, I've been following you since your Omicron meme. And I think you're so funny. I've been following your story. And this is your wife. I know you guys just got married. Why don't you come join us in the Audi VIP booth? And I was like, how funny is that? Like, I've done many shows in London. I've been to London many times. But a stupid, you know, dumb and dumber meme <laughs> is what gets me recognized and gets me into the VIP section at yeah. the Rock the Park Music Festival. So, Jeez, yeah. man. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. So... With this com the comedy tour and the book, like, like what, what's your day in life look like now? Is it just like... Dude, it's nuts. It's just nuts. My alarm goes off at 8.15 every day, which okay. I'm not one of those Mark Wahlberg get up. It's 4.30, <laughs> guys. Eight, you know, I used to sleep till noon every day yeah, when yeah. I was in my 20s and out, you know, trying to get laid all the time and stayed up all night. Um, it's wild that you still say that, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's part of my truth, baby. I feel you, man. I like um, it, though. But now I'm up, my alarm goes off at 8.15. I have a coffee in my hand, and I'm sitting at my desk by 9 o'clock. And from 9 to 5, I'm working. I'm working on I'm working on bookings. I'm working on making posters. I'm working on promoting shows. I'm working on traveling, like tra travel routing. I'm working. And then, or I'm doing podcasts, or I'm doing Zoom meetings, or I'm sending emails. I come out of my office at 5. My wife and I have dinner together earlier. Then I start getting ready, and I usually have a show at night. I'm checked into the venue by 7. Show starts at 8. I'm off stage by 10. I drive home, watch a little TV when I get home to come down, go to bed, do the same thing. Hmm. It's every day. Every day. People, like, even if I wanted to get in a regular job, which I'll never do again, but if I wanted to get a job, I wouldn't even have time to have a job. Like, unless I was doing consulting or something like that over Zoom during the day, sure. But I could never be able to clock in anywhere. Yeah. It'd be impossible. Yeah. I, I, I would need six versions of me. It's funny you say that because, like, when I had to go into work, travel, commute, like, 20, 30 minutes, now I'm working from home. Yeah. All I do is I just open up my computer and then <laughs> I'm like, there. I'm checked in. But I accumulate all my fucking hours back. Yeah. And it's amazing because I can... I work with my set schedule, but once I'm done doing things, I just put shit down and I'm back into focusing with the podcast or sending out those emails, sending out those pitches and things like that. Yeah. And it just pays to like knowing people productivity. One is the biggest thing you need to have. Sure. And knowing just understanding your schedule, you know what I mean? Yeah. And especially if you have a dating life or yeah. marriage life, you got to make sure you just have all of that dialed in because if it's you just, don't, it's just fracturing your day into chunks of time right and and you know if i'm promoting a tour i'm so busy like i am so busy like i have three press interviews on this tuesday coming one at 11 in toronto one at three in hamilton and then one at seven over zoom that's going to timmins 
And those are back-to-backs. And in those, I'm making posters and promoting shows and whatever. And I'm one of those comics where some comics, they'll book a show, and then that's it. They just book the show, and then they just show up and hope that there's people there. Mm -hmm. That's not me. Mm -hmm. If I promote a show, especially as my own promoter, I do not rest until that show is sold out. There is no let off the gas pedal until the show is sold out. I was about to go on stage last night in Hamilton at a theater that had 800 people on it in it and I was checking in with a venue in Bracebridge, Ontario to see how many tickets had sold. And they went, oh yeah, we're sold out. I went, great. Screen capped it, put it up, show sold out. I, I'm constantly, I'm looking them at like like pimples to pop. Like I'm looking at them like that show needs to go. That one's struggling, so I need the sales for that. I need to focus my promotion on that. And it's like, yeah, I'm checking the ticket numbers, but I'm also checking to see how much time I have to put in to promote the show to sell it out. When do you feel like you'll get an assistant? Because I think like everybody that's a yeah. content creator, or we're in our respective realms. We need to have somebody that can kind of take away that. For sure. And my wife tells me all the time I need mm -hmm. an assistant. My wife tells me, she's like, you're going to run yourself like ragged. You're going to yeah. you're gonna burn yourself out. You need to hire someone. The issue is, and I need to get better at releasing this control, is I'm a huge control freak. That's the thing. And I'm happy and you said that. Every yep. time I've delegated a job to somebody else, they fuck it up. They fuck it up. Yep. And it takes me twice as much to go in and fix it. Yep. So especially why when you have your friends, especially when you give your friends yeah, like exactly. power, you bring them in and to do you, things. Then and then you ruin the relationship, right? So I can't right? hire I can't hire any of my friends because I can't fire any of my friends. <laughs> and I love firing people. <laughs> I love no, I don't love firing people, but I do love if hey, I give you a job and you do not do it, we have to talk. And I don't want to have those talks with friends. You know what I mean? That's why my wife keeps telling me I got to get a VA, a virtual assistant from someone in, you know, the wherever, Philippines wherever the world, like that, Philippines, yeah. wherever. Um, but I've dealt with, or with promoters who use VAs, and you know you're talking to someone that has nothing to do with the business. You know that you're talking to someone that has no stake involved. You, they don't care. Yeah, they get paid, but it's not their, their baby. So they relinquish that control, and then the, the relationships suffer. Yep. So I almost need, my wife almost, almost suggests that she kind of manages me, which she does to a degree anyways. Yeah. But I would never be able to hire my wife because, you know, that's, uh, that's it's just, I don't want to bring work fights into life fights. Right. You know what I mean? But unless, unless when Netflix cuts that check, then it's a whole sure. different conversation. I think someday this will all be laughable and I'll be laughing yeah. about the times that I didn't want a management team. In Tulum or, 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 or what did Eddie Murphy say? Naked, naked in Tahiti? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I will get there. But right now, I enjoy the hustle. That's another part about it. I enjoy the work. I enjoy booking the shows and I enjoy promoting the shows and I enjoy doing the press and I enjoy doing the promo pr promotion and I enjoy every aspect that leads up to the show. So I almost don't want to take that away from my own self. Uh, but sometimes it is a lot. Like if I'm sitting in my office and I'm booking out, you know, 75 shows and I have to make 75 posters with 75 pieces of press to go with it with 75 press kits with 75 emails. Mm. I'm Garrett sitting there going like, Oh my God. Well, writing a book, well, being a husband, you know what I mean? Well, trying to maintain the house and, and you know, the, the daily tasks that come with that loading the dishwasher, do the dishwasher, you know, sweep it up and clean it up and fixing the pillows on the couch. And you know what I mean? Like that's just part of it. But it speaks to the epitome of being a man, right? And of I course. think a lot of this is where it's like I champion because I'm bringing the coaching back, right? Sure. I got that 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 itch. I said 2024, bring the coaching back, right? And really championing men and women to become better. And sure. you speak by how many things you do, and it's being like a hundred percent in every single fucking one. Well, no one's gonna do it for you, right? right? And I I love the idea of coaching, and I love the idea of coaches. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, because Olympians need coaches. You know what I mean? If you want to be a gold medalist, you need a good coach. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how naturally talented you are. Doesn't know. Doesn't matter your natural athletic ability. You need someone to stand there and go. What if you tried it a different way? Mm -hmm. What if you, when you were jumping off the the beam that you twisted your hips a little bit more and they go, oh yeah, that's smart, and they do it and it gets them the gold level status. For sure. So I, I'm not against coaching. I'm not against positivity. I'm not against you know. Um, 
you know, conferences and things like Tony Robbins and stuff like that. Um, my wife in her real estate world is very into that. You know, she's mm. a big follower of people like Ed Milet and yeah, yeah. Tony Robbins and stuff like that. And she's introduced me to that world. And to be honest, I was a little skeptical of it. Cause I was like, I don't need someone to just tell me what to do. I'm mm. already mm -hmm. fucking killing, you know, but then you kind of drink the Kool-Aid and you submit to the idea that it's okay for someone else to at least guide you. Yeah, 100%. Um, because there's certain avenues we need to have, like, just reinforce a little bit. You know yeah. what I mean? To, for us to, like, get to that next level. You know what you I mean? Know, every master carpenter or master tile maker or master whatever has an apprentice. And the apprentice is there to learn and to mm -hmm. guide. Mm -hmm. And then eventually the apprentice goes to the master and goes, I see what you're doing here, but what, the, what I'm learning, wouldn't it be more interesting if you did it this way? And even the master has to go, you're right. I could do it that way. You know, so I, with me, with comedians is I bring a, a guy by the name of Jordan Armanese as my traveling like host and opening act. Mm -hmm. He's one of my longest friends. I've known him since I was nine years old. And he just recently kind of got back into stand-up comedy and he fell back in love with it. So we do a show together and then on the car ride home, we're talking about the highs and lows of the show and what worked and what didn't work and how could we have done things differently in this way or could this joke be a little bit better if you tried it like this or if you sped up your timing like that you know what i mean like what is the way that we can make this better if we both can be better and it's like i'm the master he's the apprentice he's the master i'm the apprentice we're sharing information with each other about the things that we liked about the show and the jokes that worked and the jokes that didn't that relationship is so valuable when i walked off stage last night after killing for 15 minutes in front of 800 people the first person standing there was my wife. The second person standing there was Jordan. Mm. He gave me a big hug and he's like, let's go, mm. let's go. Let's go. Like he's so excited for my success and I'm excited for his success. That's a truly beneficial relationship. You, you know, when there's other that. comics who you will need see me that, do 15 though. minutes and be like, hey man, can I open for you sometime? And I go like, I'm, yeah. I'm good, man. You need that though. You need that though because you need those, if it's your, you know, your wife, if it's your, you know, friend that's there, like, when I look at this podcasting thing, and I can say this as somebody that's being single, where I'm like, look, where I'm about to go, I have to have the right people in front of me. Sure. Because if they're not there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mess with you. You can't be on the road touring, but then the night before you had a whole fucking fight with your wife. Yeah. yeah and then going sure. to go on stage because that's going to fuck with you. For sure. You want to make sure it's like, yo, what, if, you have, if we have something here, how do we check in, do your daily check-ins? Or maybe you have, you know, something spat with your friend. Like once I'm done all this today, I have one of my one of my friends from a while back. We disconnected. Yeah. He's like, yo, we gotta reconnect. Yeah. And so I gotta save that space to get into that conversation sure. because sure. like he sees what's going on. He yeah. sees it. And I'm pretty sure I see what's going on. But it's like we just gotta come back and try to just lock it back in. You yeah. know what I mean? Because it's like we need we need people that's gonna just be around us, you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> With that book, because here's the thing is with that book there. I'm going to keep it real with that book because I want to read it and I want to listen to I want the audio book first before I actually sure. want to read it because yeah, yeah. I want to read both parts of it. What do you feel like was the most challenging chapter in that book you had to write? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple tough ones in there. Um, you know, f for me, it was really fun to talk about the vintage days of wrestling and being on tour with my dad and all the wrestlers coming by the house and, you know, some of the crazy people and characters and, and whatever. Um, but you know, the hardest part for me was talking about my dad's alcoholism and my dad died of, from being an alcoholic. My dad died of liver kidney failure. Um, I wrote, there's a chapter in the book called the cleanup kid and, okay. and it was the hardest chapter to write for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, what was the premise of the of the of the chapter is this now my dad was really struggling with alcoholism uh i used to get home from work at or sorry i used to get home from school at 3 30. my mom used to get home from work at five and i used to come in the house at 3 30 at school after school and if i walked in the house and my dad was wasted and passed out on the couch i took it as my job to clean him up I would try, this, my dad was six foot five, 275. Mm. I'm like nine years old at this time. So I'm maybe a hundred pounds. I would try to drag him up and pick him up and get him into the shower and get him showered and shaved and cleaned up so I could have him cleaned up before my mom got home from work at five because I was trying to trick her that he wasn't drunk. 
because if he was drunk and she knew it, there would be a fight. Shit. And I didn't want there to be a fight. So I wow. took it as my job to try to clean him up. And the story goes on and on and on. And, you know, I had the school got involved. And I stopped wanting to go to school because I wanted to be able to home, be a home and watch him. And I would go to school and I would be so nervous about him being drunk that I would get sick and I would throw up and they would send me home from school. It was like, it's all very, very, you know, sad, A. Eh? Um, but I haven't, I hadn't been to that place mentally since I was there living it. And to go back into that place as a, 33 year old married man with a home and a career it was terrifying and it was hard to do but i healed that kid when i when i told that kid's story in this book i healed him mm. i healed that younger version of myself healing energy my man and you know they, they they talk about that they talk about you know healing your inner child and i healed him and i it was like the biggest most beautiful tension and trauma releasing thing I've ever done. And it's, you know, one of the most powerful chapters of the book. People message me and go, Hey, I just read the cleanup kid. I didn't know that about you. And maybe I misjudged you for, you know, the type of person that you are. Cause I, I'm a fixer. I try to fix things all the time. If people are fighting, I try to fix it. If, if things are going bad, I'm trying to fix it. And I now know where that comes from. Cause I was the cleanup kid, you know, as, so. as us, talking now on this podcast have you recorded that the audio version of that yes yeah yeah, yeah. was that was that tough yeah to it was tough I was crying and stuff like that i Jesus, had to keep taking man. it different takes over and over again Damn. And, and uh but i left a lot of it in i think i'm gonna leave a lot of this you know the like sniffling and stuff into the audiobook because it's real to. I, it, I feel that yeah, yeah and man. you know that's that's part of the story and i again i didn't shy away from it i didn't um i owed it to my reader to tell the truth and the truth is the number one thing that will be the most beautiful thing. And the truth will set you free, they say. Absolutely. And, you know, if I lied or sugarcoated or omitted the truth or just avoided the truth, I felt like I was doing a disservice to the reader. And so I just told the truth. And here we are. So love that. Love that, man. Mm. Jesus. I feel it now. Yeah. I'm feeling it. He's hit me with yeah, it. Hit me yeah. in the feels, man. Looking forward to that. Is there a part two of the book? I mean, I guess the part Coming? two is at the middle towards the end of my career. Yeah. You, know, you know, I have a son or a daughter who's maybe, what well, I don't care what they do. I'm not going to push my kid into show business, although it is the best business in the world. Could be maybe both. Maybe uh, does maybe does comedian and does wrestling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I don't know what the future holds, and yeah. I know, but I know it's going to be a crazy ride, and I know it's going to be worth a book someday. You know, just the things I've experienced alone as, a, as an adult man so far, just in my own career, have, are worthy of its own documentary. It's worthy of its own sitcom. It's worthy of its own whatever. It is. It's coming. And those though. things will come. It's coming. So the story of how I get my first sitcom or how I get my big Netflix special or Amazon special or whatever, or how I sell out a national theater tour, that's its own story, which will be, you know, run with the bull part two or run with go. the Eric. There you you know what I mean? So I'm here for it, man. Yeah, man. And merch, you got merch and all that. I'm wearing my own merch right now. I like and, that, man. Uh, Product yeah. placement at its <laughs> finest. Let's talk about it. <laughs> well, man, my merch, my merch sells like crazy. And I think the biggest reason why my merch sells like crazy is because it's all based on truth, right? Yeah. I started a clothing company called, or clothing brand rather, called Whipwear. My dad was Bull Whip Johnson. So this was a this is a bull whip. And on the back of this shirt, uh, it's the original design for a gym that my grandfather and dad owned in the 1970s and 80s in Hamilton. And it was called Bull's Gym. I found the original design on a folded up piece of paper in my basement and had it made into my own merchandise. Shit. So it's a story because I said on another podcast recently, like if my merch was just like me, like just my face with like a thumbs up, it would be fucking boring. Like yeah. I wouldn't buy that. It's captivating. That's though. what I mean, I like right? That. All my stuff has like a wrestling angle to it. Like I have a wrestling style t-shirt of my face and I'm wearing my dad's wrestling gear and it says Eric Johnston, don't mess with the bull, you know, and it looks like a vintage wrestling tee. I have run with the bull merchandise. I have stickers. I have, I have the book now, obviously. So people come over to my merch table and it's like a spectacle for them. And uh, they hear the stories in the show, then they can take a piece of that story home with them, which sure. is why I think the book, or sorry, the, the merchandise has been so successful and why I think the book has been so successful. 
because people are hearing and believing and knowing the story and wanting to take a piece home with them. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to get controversial here. Okay, go ahead. You, you're you're all about wrestling. Yeah, man. I want. I saw you do a picture with uh, Adam Copeland, AEW. No, I was with Edge. Adam Copeland. Oh, Adam Copeland. I thought you said Adam Cole. He was also in AEW. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Adam like, Cole, you know what I'm doing Cole, here, right? Uh, yes. Come yeah. on now. So right now, top five wrestlers of all time. Oh, good question. Um. Okay. Uh -huh. So being Canadian, and because I know the family, I think for me, number one is Bret Hart. Oh, Lord of mercy. <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> the excellence of execution yeah the greatest of all time that Shawn michaels didn't wash him in the ring though yeah but i don't like sean because of the type of person he was i, <laughs> I just know too much of his story to really we all do it. we yeah. all do <laughs> and um i think I, I was a big i was a big rock and stone cold guy yeah. um so there would be two and three or three and two respect respectfully you know that Attitude Era was my era of professional wrestling. My dad's wrestling every weekend. The Attitude Era, the WWF at the time, has never been bigger. And the promos and the match setups and the everything that they did for, you know, The Rock and Stone Cold. It's crazy. Some of the greatest storytelling in the history of professional wrestling. Absolutely. Um, so those are, you know, so if I start with Bret Hart, then I go, uh, you know, uh, one and two or two and three of The Rock and Stone Cold. Number four would have to be Ric Flair. I'm a huge flair guy, not just because of his in-ring execution, which is insane if you know some of his story, that he would call all the matches in, in the ring and tell these crazy stories and learn ways to sell the, the moves the best way and and uh, all that stuff. Um, that would be number four. And then, I mean, this probably should have been number one because it's my dad, but I would say my dad is my favorite wrestler yeah. of all time. Yeah, so sure. then just shift everyone. So, <laughs> shift <Bullwin>, everyone. <laughs> then Bret Hart, and then Rock and Stone Cold, and then uh, Ric Flair. So there you go. Is there one person right now, right, that you could sit like a raw table for three? Yeah. Table for three, because they do that with WWE now. Yeah, yeah. Who would you put at that table of three when we're talking pro wrestling? I mean, if we're talking about current, you know, current wrestlers again, I the Rock's back in the game. He's heel Rock. I would love to sit down with Rock because there's so much that we can relate to with each other. You know, father fought. He followed in the wrestling footsteps, but then he went into acting. He's also funny, comedic actor, serious actor. Uh, the ability to work a microphone, the ability to whatever. I would learn so much about more about what I do and what he does. And I just think we'd have a lot in common. You know what I mean? Like, I think we would really find each other in each other. So I think that would be really cool. Um, and then I don't know who the other person would be. Like, I love Kevin Owens just because of his story in yeah. Montreal and Canadian wrestling and stuff. And um, yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. I think it would just be me and The Rock, and I would just leave the door open for someone to pop in. <laughs> Maybe you get the whole bloodline side coming yeah, through. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you get Roman sitting at yeah, that table. Yeah, you know what I mean? Sitting the head of the table. I know, right? Yeah. No, for sure, for sure. You know, man, from the time we made this connection from Clubhouse yeah, to you coming on the podcast doing scary movies i remember that clip oh yeah that fuck yeah. It was one of them clips i had people dming me like yo what the fuck is going on here <laughs> right to our sit down conversation you were on the vino having the vino oh, wine and yeah, stuff like yeah, that yeah, 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 and yeah. then this in person man it's just it's, it's remarkable dream, to man. see it's, it bro it's been great to see you go for it too right yeah, i mean man. it's clear and evident that my career is taking off and i think that the i think the pandemic slowed my career mm -hmm. in a way that i was frustrated about yeah but now i look back and it's a way that i it's perfect timing. Yeah. You know, because I was kind of on the on the brink of of really getting to the next level of my career in like the first couple months of 2020. You know, in the first, second week of March, I did seven sold out shows at the Laugh Factory in Chicago. And I was like, this is it. I'm going to hit. The, the, the manager at the Laugh Factory was like, I want to call, personally call the manager at the Hollywood Laugh Factory, get you on. Like, I think there's so much we could do with you. You're ready you know, your, your materials there, your personas there now is your time. And then the pandemic hit and everything stopped, right. And everything got delayed and everything got pushed. Um, but now I think my point of view, my maturity level, my life level in terms of being married and having a home and finding love and finding my purpose and finding my, you know, my reason, um, now I'm best 
better served for to hit now. And I think the pandemic was, although awful, made sense for me. And now my material's never been better. You know, personally, my mental health has never been better. You know, my my life is just great now. So now it's like this this you know gift from God or the universe where it's saying saying, hey, we held you back for a bit, but now you're gonna run, mm. and it's the right time for you to my run. Guy. My guy. And I hope that, you know, and no matter how big I get, I'll always come and come into the studio in London yeah. and I might not be here much longer. You hey, never know what might happen, man. I might have to come up your, come up your way, you know? <laughs> well, wherever you want to be. There's a lot of studios in Hamilton and yes, Toronto. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Before we get out of here, I always ask my guests, 1% better. Mm -hmm. You spoke to a lot yeah. as an author, comedian, showbiz. In your words, for the audience, somebody you can give them that inspiration. How can they get 1% better? Yeah, I, I I think for me, it's just so clear of just showing up and like just continually showing up, physically showing up for shows, for podcasts, for opportunities, for meetings, whatever, but also showing up for yourself and allowing yourself to not be perfect and allowing yourself to to fuck it up and learn and change and allowing yourself to look at things in a different way and allowing people to look at things for you in a different way and allowing people to let, you know, come into your world. I'm very cautious about who I let into my world mm -hmm. and I'm kind of less cautious, but I'm okay if it goes to shit uh -huh. because I'm standing on such solid ground that if someone tries to come in and kick my legs out from me, they won't be able to. Mm. So now I'm kind of, you're talking to him. You're talking to him. <laughs> I'm more willing to let people in and I'm, I'll let people show up. You know what I mean? And, and for me, the biggest thing is giving myself that little bit of grace. You know, in show business, I think I've said this to you before in other podcasts, but I'll reiterate it for your listeners now. In show business, it feels like everybody's running a race, but nobody knows what place they're in. So you're just showing up every day and you're lacing up your shoes and you're running and you're so focused on getting to the finish line. The second you realize that there is no finish line, life is the race and running it every day is living. So if you are not showing up to run every day, then you're just still and you're stagnant and you're not running, which means you're not living. You know what I mean? I have these moments where I go, you know, what place am I in? And then I do a show like last night and it's 750, 800 people are losing their fucking minds, laughing, smacking their legs, rolling out of the chairs, getting applause breaks, whatever. I look around and I go, I don't know what place I'm in, but I got to be near the front. I've got to be. But again, there is no front. There is no, it's just showing up. The biggest thing that I've learned is I've gone so many places and I've done so many things and I'm so focused on getting somewhere or was so focused on getting somewhere that I never took the time to look back and appreciate all the places that I'd been. And I've taken these moments and I've looked back and I've gone, wow, I've done some shit, man. I'm 33 years old. I'm 14 years into my comedy career. And in so many ways, I'm just getting started. But I look back and I was like, shit, I'm on commercials all over the world. I'm on TV in 170 countries in the world. I performed at the Laugh Factory. I performed at the Comedy Store. I'm passed by so many clubs in Canada and major clubs in the States. I've opened for Russell Peters. I've opened for Sebastian Maniscalco. I walk into a room, people know who I am and where I came from and how I got there. They know my dad's story. They know my grandfather's story. They know my wife's story. They know where I live. They know where I'm from. And I walk into a room and they go, the bull is here. That's it. Uh, it. In so many ways, I've already made it. Now, the rest of the time is just extra fun time and money. That's going to be fun. <laughs> That's going to be great. But I'm still going to be the same guy. If you, if you gave me $10 million tomorrow morning, I, oh, 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 my God. What is love just started playing on my phone? A TikTok started playing on my phone. They was having such a good moment. You got to be kidding me. Uh, uh, that is so funny. Okay. I do love that song, but I don't listen to it every day. Holy shit, uh, the timing. <laughs> what the fuck? 
fuck, what was I saying? I was on such a good run there. Dude, you guys on a run, immaculate run. Well, that is perfect. What is love? And that's, you know what? That's a lesson too. Sometimes it's just got to be funny, man. Hey, man. It's listen, gotta be funny. fucking just a brilliant man. <laughs> listen, bro. Love Whoa. you, man. Love you, man. Love everything you got going on real quick. Thanks, bro. Plug your information. Where can everybody, hey, check that oh, book yeah, out. Oh, yeah, here. I'll show the book. I brought it and I left it on the floor. This is uh, Run With The Bull, Three Generations of Sports and Entertainment, available now on Amazon. Uh, available now, sorry, a little lower, uh, available now on Amazon uh, and also for sale at any of my upcoming shows. Go to ericjohnstonwho.com. Find me on Jeez. tour. Run with the bull. I'll sell you a book. And if I like you, I'll sign that book. Ah, <laughs> sign my guy. Book. My fucking guy. Holy